Hi there, you're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Interview episode, The Roman Republic at War with Dr. Brett Devereaux. Hi there, everyone. Today I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Brett Devereaux as a guest on the show. A teaching assistant professor at North Carolina State University, Dr. Devereaux is a historian of ancient and military history, whose work primarily focuses on the socioeconomic impact of warfare in ancient Rome. He also is frequently active on his personal blog, a collection of unmitigated pedantry, publishing articles on a variety of subjects that range from specialized historical topics to analyses of the world-building of Tolkien. Today he is here to discuss the nature of warfare during the Roman Republic, an appropriate topic as we approach Rome's conquest of Greece. Let me just say welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Thanks for having me. This is going to be so much fun. Would you give my listeners a bit about your background and how your studies came to be fixated on the ancient world? Yeah, so I have to run through my standard scholarly pedigree. I have my BA in history from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, a master's in classics from Florida State University, and then my PhD in ancient history from UNC Chapel Hill. I actually ended up approaching the Roman military increasingly during my PhD studies from the economic angle. I was interested in large state functions and the ways that large empires worked. Of course, Rome's particularly large, and the largest element of the Roman state apparatus is, of course, the army. Remains, that remains true from the Republic through the Empire. The largest single part of the state by far is the army, and so I began looking at it from this angle. And as I was working to understand the impact of the Roman army, I found myself increasingly somewhat ironically drawn out of the Empire, which is where I had started, into the period of the Republic because it seemed the more decisive period. I mean, you know, I'm looking at the 3rd and 2nd centuries, particularly, and I'm sure your listeners can know and understand this, particularly because this is the period where Rome's dominance emerges, where Rome goes from just one of several major great powers to the dominant power. It's hard to imagine that anybody in, say, 265 is going to look at the Mediterranean and say, yeah, Rome, that's the next big thing much less that the Romans are going to clear the deck, so to speak, to take out all of the other major powers. I don't think that's predictable, and that's what makes it so interesting. Turning to the subject of the day, let us talk about the Roman military, more specifically that of the Middle Republic, a period stretching from the 3rd to the 2nd century BC. At this time, Rome would establish a Mediterranean-wide empire, battling the powerful states of Punic Carthage, Antigone in Macedonia, and the Seleucid Empire in the process. Yet in each instance, they came out on top. Can you paint us a picture of the Roman Republic's military capabilities during their wars with Carthage and the Hellenistic East? And what sort of sources can we rely on to give us a reasonable framework? Yeah, so let's start with sources. There are obviously a, a lot of sources that discuss this period, many much later. But the core of the study of the Roman army in this period is still substantially reliant on Polybius and Livy. Polybius is a Greek. He's writing around 150 BC. He has lots of access through his patron, Scipio Emilianus. We don't have all of Polybius. We do need to be very cautious with Polybius. Polybius is making an argument. And the argument he is making to a Greek audience in part is don't resist Rome. And so he's making an argument about how the rise of Rome was inevitable. That makes him really interested in structural factors that aided Rome's rise, and Polybius makes arguments about the advantages of Rome's political structure, of Rome's military, the way they fight, even down to the fortification stakes they bring. He's like, the Romans' ones are better. But we have to take all of this with a grain of salt because this is all in service of his argument, and it's increasingly clear that Polybius is quite reliable as ancient sources go. He does not lie to you much. But he may bend the facts. I think this is most obvious in his discussion of the Roman navy that uh, recent naval archaeological finds from the Battle of the Agates Island, the last battle of the First Punic War off the coast of Sicily, have suggested that Polybius maybe exaggerated the average size of the warships of that war to make it seem bigger and more impressive. He doesn't lie about it. He just conveniently doesn't tell you that a lot of the ships were quite a bit smaller than he's implying but not saying. 
So we do have to be a bit careful with Polybius, but he is an outsider looking in, which makes him really valuable. Livy, by contrast, is writing during the Augustan period, much later. He's a Roman from Cisalpine Gaul, so he is one of these Romans who, in the period he's writing about, would not have been a Roman or a citizen, but he's obviously writing later, and so he is. And Livy certainly imagines himself, uh, he's in the court of Augustus, to be writing something like an official state history. He has a lot of access to official records, which is really handy. Like Polybius, he tends to be pretty reliable. In particular, he tends to signal to us when he's uncertain or when he thinks his sources are unreliable, which is really handy. But at the same time, Livy is very vulnerable to anachronism. He tends to assume things have always worked the way that they've always worked. And so the earlier you get in his histories, the more confused he is. There is also a tendency in Livy to retroject perhaps a degree of unity in Italy and a degree of foreordainedness of Roman conquest than might actually be the case. So as always, we need to be careful with our sources. In terms of Roman military power, it's really easy here to just lean on Polybius for a second. Polybius offers two quite famous markers of Roman military power. In Book 1, he notes that Rome, in the course of the First Punic War, lost some 800 ships. And if you run all the numbers from all of his battles, yeah, that does seem to stand up internally with his narrative. The Rome lost about 800 ships, and that, as he says, this would make it by far the largest naval war to have at that point ever happened on the Mediterranean. Arguably the largest naval war to have happened on the Mediterranean to date. And his point here is, of course, if the Romans can produce such force, uh, how can you possibly fight them? As he says, he's endeavoring to show that Rome's victory was not due to chance. He also gives, in Book 2, a report of a sort of emergency Roman census performed in 225. The Romans are expecting a Gallic invasion in 225. Everyone's really panicked. Normally, the Roman census only counts Roman citizen households. Unusually, in this moment, they extend that census and demand all of the allies, the Sogii, Rome's non-Roman subordinated communities that supply troops to Rome's armies in Italy, that all of these communities also report how many men they have liable for conscription, how many people could we raise theoretically. The number is about 700,000 men liable for conscription. Polybius perhaps has made a couple of small errors in tabulating it. There's a mountain of scholarship on this figure, so about 700,000 men liable for conscription, which Polybius immediately makes a horribly unfair comparison with the mere 20,000 men that Hannibal is about to cross the Alps with. It's an unfair comparison, of course. That's Hannibal's army in being after it has been massively reduced in strength by crossing the Alps versus this very notional how many troops total could the Romans potentially have had? The Romans never raised all 700,000 troops. They couldn't. But nevertheless, it is demonstrative of the seemingly limitless well of Roman military resources. I'll offer one more example of just the almost preposterous scale of Roman military potential in this period. By 216, after three catastrophic defeats, the Romans had probably lost more than 70,000 men fighting Hannibal. And yet, by the end of 216, Roman forces under arms probably number more than 100,000. And between 214 and 212, the Romans probably call up something like a quarter of a million men for service. And for the audience for whom those numbers are just, you know, they're just numbers, they don't make sense. What is 250,000 men processed through the army in two years? For scale, Alexander the Great invaded Persia with 48,500 men. This is preposterously larger. That enormous well of Roman resources really is the focus of my research. What was the nature of those resources, and how was it possible that Rome had such a large resource base to fight with? As you mentioned previously, one of the key advantages attributed to the success of the Roman Republic was their ability to draw upon massive amounts of manpower, presumably a consequence of Italy's agricultural prosperity. Yet the Hellenistic kingdoms possessed some of the most productive and densely populated lands in the world, such as Mesopotamia and Egypt, 
never mind the fact that they controlled far more territory. With this in mind, what differentiated Rome's ability to mobilize their population for military service when compared to other competing states? I think this is a good framing to start with because this is certainly the framing that is how scholars have understood this question for a very long time, and Polybius's habit of counting men encourages it, right? The sense of manpower. It is, as Nicholas Secunda put it in one work, horde upon uncomplaining horde of Roman peasant manpower that wins the day. This is actually one of the things that I push back against in my research. Manpower, we need to stress, isn't enough. As you note, Italian agriculture is very productive, but the total population of Roman Italy in this period is perhaps somewhere between 5 and 7 million, which is about the same as the population in Ptolemaic Egypt proper, not including any broader imperial possessions, and far less than maybe 15, maybe 20, maybe 25 million people living in the Seleucid Empire. Rome does not have any sort of absolute demographic advantage. It does not have more people. What it does have is the ability to get more people under arms, and that's a, a really striking and important difference. It has, to borrow Michael Taylor's phrasing, more manpower effective, but not more manpower raw. So what do you need to get men under arms? You don't just need the men. In fact, if you look at the structure of ancient agriculture, the men is the one thing that you have a lot of. The tendency for ancient farming families, in as much as we can observe them, is that your family expands until your farming plot can no longer support them. So the family expands to consume the food of your farm. The family does not expand to suffice the labor of your farm. And so in practice, what you end up with in most peasant agricultural economies are families that, as units of labor, are much too large for their farms. And so the irony is that you actually have lots of spare people in the countryside, lots of young men for whom there really isn't a lot of labor for them to do because they're the second or third or fourth adult male in their household. Their household maybe requires two adult males to actually do all the farming labor available to it. And it can, of course, draw upon the labor of the women in the household, too, if necessary, in a pinch. The women are mostly engaged in different economic tasks, uh, textile production in particular, which are, I feel the need to note, very important and worth studying. And I also discuss those, but kind of orthogonal to our topic today. So you need men, but men are actually pretty easy to get. But you also need food to feed these soldiers once you've pulled them off the farm. You need animals to carry all of their stuff. And you need the stuff. You need all of their equipment. That equipment needs to be manufactured, and it generally needs to be manufactured by craftsmen who are not right farmers. They need to be supplied by the farmers. And so to actually create an army, what you need isn't manpower so much. What you need is surplus. You need agricultural surplus. You need food produced in the countryside in excess of its needs that you can get a hold of in some way. And then you can direct it to, th to other things, whether that other things is feeding a soldier or feeding a blacksmith that armors that soldier or feeding a mule that carries that soldier's tent. So you need surplus, and that's the question. And to give a sense of how extensive the cost of this kind of equipment is, let's just we can just walk through a really fun way of thinking about it. Uh, so a well-equipped Roman infantryman in this period is probably wearing something like 10 to 12 kilograms of iron and bronze equipment between his armor and his weapons, especially if he's wearing, as is increasingly common in this period, male, the Lorica Hamada, male armor. The Romans pick this armor up from the Gauls. They decide they love it and begin equipping everybody with it, though it does take some time to seemingly to work its way down the socioeconomic spectrum because it's very expensive. But so you've got like 12 kilograms or so maybe of metal equipment on this kind of infantryman. Each one kilogram of that, there are 12, each one probably required a billet of raw iron of maybe 1.2 kilograms to go to the forge. Okay, that probably requires something like 10 to 15 kilograms of iron ore to be mined. The process of smelting and forging that probably then requires something like 20 kilograms of charcoal. And getting 20 kilograms of charcoal requires you to cut down about 140 kilograms of wood because you then have to reduce it to charcoal. And this whole process for this one kilogram might require something like 10 total man days of labor to produce all of the raw materials, and then several more days of labor for the smith at the end to turn it into something like a sword. 
And you now need to repeat that task 12 times for every soldier in your army. And so the infrastructure that you need is much bigger than just manpower because every single person in that chain, the logger felling the trees, the charcoaler making the charcoal, the miners producing the iron, the smelter smelting the iron, the smith turning the iron into something useful, and then the soldier who actually carries that thing into battle, every single person in that chain needs to be fed because they are not farming right now. And so, again, the question is extracting surplus. The question is all about mobilizing surplus agricultural production to support people who can't be engaged in agriculture. And of course, that's really hard because agricultural productivity is really, really low. You might need something like eight or nine farmers to support one non-farmer. So we can then think about different systems for doing this. And we're really talking here about mobilization systems. I think the best way to think about these sorts of systems is to think about them in two really broad categories. The first category is what I sometimes call engines of force. This is the tax and spend system, and this is how the Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires run. This is substantially how Carthage works, though it's something of a hybrid system. And there are elements of this in the Antigonid system, but the Antigonid system is weird. Basically, the idea here is that you have an army. You got it from Alexander. You use the army and its threat of violence to extract tax revenue from a subordinate population. That revenue can be in money or it can be in raw agricultural products. In practice, it's probably going to be in both. You then use that money, that revenue, to support and expand the army, which then, of course, manages your extraction, which then manages your army, which then manages your extraction, and so on and so forth, right? It is a self-licking ice cream cone. The advantage to this system is that it scales extremely well allowing the state to dispose massive amounts of wealth directly. And listeners, uh, Michael Taylor in his book, Soldiers in Silver, has actually done a great job of compiling a lot of the evidence we have for the scale of state finance in this period. He estimates that, like the Seleucid revenues annually are something like 50 million Attic drachma, and Ptolemaic revenues are 75. Absolutely staggering sums. Those are very rough estimates, but even as order of magnitude estimates, they're enormous. By comparison, Rome is like 10. So we're talking about taxation systems that are four, five, six, seven times what Rome has in this period. That said, there are disadvantages to this sort of tax and spend system. The first disadvantage is that it's brittle. If for some reason you lose the army, you have lost the means to extract revenue to raise the army again. And I think this goes a long way to explaining why Hellenistic states respond to individual battlefield defeats by making peace because they have the field army, they have their garrisons at home. If they lose both of them, you're done. That's it. The force that sustains your state is gone. So if you're defeated in the field and you've lost most of the field army, what you need to do is make a deal. What you don't do is what the Romans do, which is like raise more guys and try again. You only had the one army and you cannot afford to lose it. So they're brittle. They also impose tremendous administrative costs. After all, nobody likes to pay taxes. So if you're going to tax so much out of the countryside to pay for this army, um, that means you need tax collectors and inspectors. You need to know how much people are producing so that you can tax them efficiently. These all need to be literate bureaucrats who are terribly expensive, so on and so forth. Apergus, in his The Seleucid Royal Economy, estimates that the cost of this administration for the Seleucid Empire may have been something like two to 3,000 talents of silver annually, which is something like a fifth of total revenues. I think that he's probably a touch too high on that estimate for what it's worth. But the fact that we're even talking about something like a fifth or even a tenth of total revenues merely sustaining the taxation system tells you this is not a very efficient system. It's very expansive, but it's not very efficient. The other problems you face, your soldiers are in it for money, so they expect to be paid and paid well. Seleucid and Ptolemaic soldiers get paid more than Antigonid soldiers who get paid more than Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers get paid about half of what Antigonid soldiers get paid, and Antigonid soldiers get paid about half of what Ptolemaic and Seleucid soldiers get paid when you account for the latter's additional allowances for rations. And so if you're running that kind of raw force engine system where you're just taxing, and then you're paying the soldiers, you have to pay them a lot. You also often have to give them land grants for when you're at peace. 
So they're really expensive. The armies to run the system are expensive on a man-for-man basis. And then finally, if you're recruiting outside the core ethnicity that benefits from being the rulers of the empire, which are your Greek speakers in both the Ptolemaic and Seleucid states, motivation can be a problem. It's not particularly original to note, for instance, that the non-Greek speaking elements of the Seleucid army have a nasty tendency to fall apart at crucial moments when put under pressure in battle. And why not? I mean, they're there for the money, but if Antiochus loses at Magnesia, what do they care? It's not their empire. Like, why die for that guy when if we win, all it means is that his soldiers are going to show up and demand I pay more taxes? Like, what do I care? And then likewise, in the Ptolemaic example, I'm sure you'll get to this eventually in the podcast, and there's certainly considerable debate, but there has long been a suggestion that the Ptolemaic Great Revolt in the very late 200s has something to do with the decision to more heavily arm the native Egyptian forces in the Ptolemaic army, but then not actually pay them very well. So these tax and spend systems, they're very expansive. They reach very widely, but they're not very efficient, and they can be brittle. So that's one system of organizing your mobilization system. You use taxation to extract agricultural surplus from the countryside, either in the form of in-kind agricultural goods or more commonly in the form of money. And then you use that to fund your army directly through state spending. The other major kind of system you can embark on here is what I'm going to call, borrowing John Landers' definition, an entitlement-based system. These are conscript armies or levies that serve in exchange for some socially underwritten package of rights and privileges in the society, formal or informal. This is perhaps most immediately familiar to your audiences. This is how the armies of a Greek polis work. The citizenry, when the polis goes to war, the citizenry goes, they get their own weapons, and they fight for their country. The advantage, of course, of entitlement-based systems is that because the motivation in theory, for the soldiers here is that maybe they're citizens of this community or they're ethnic members of the community or they have close personal ties to the leader of the community. The exact nature of the packages of rights and privileges can be quite plastic. They can be formal, like citizenship, or informal. But nevertheless, because that motivation there is intrinsic, that you know they're thinking like, when the Helvetii go to war, I go to war because I am one of the Helvetii. As a result, you can ask these soldiers to do a lot. You can ask them to fight for low or no pay. You can ask them to buy their own equipment. You can ask them to essentially mobilize themselves. So this is the system for something like a polis army. This is also the way that military forces generally mobilized in non-state societies around the Mediterranean. This is how your Gallic war band, for instance, comes together, usually around a relatively charismatic chieftain or petty king who is using a mix of ethnic identity, fight for me because we're in the same tribe, and ties, both horizontal ties between aristocrats and vertical ties of sort of patronage to form up his army based on those people's connections to him. This is also, of course, how the Roman army works, that in the Middle Republic, at least. Later, the Romans will go to a more professional-based army, but in the Middle Republic, the way the Roman army works Every year there is a draft called the Dialectus. If you are called up as a Roman citizen, you must serve. You serve based on how wealthy you are because you're expected to buy your own equipment. Therefore, the richest are called to serve as cavalry. And then the well-to-do as heavy infantry and the poor as these light infantry skirmishers, the Willites, out in front of the army. Roman soldiers are paid, but only just barely. They're fighting because that's the obligation of citizenship. And our sources are actually really clear about that. Someone who isn't willing to fight for the privilege and freedom of citizenship shouldn't have it. And indeed, the penalty for dodging the draft was disenfranchisement and potentially being sold into slavery. So there's a really tight link between your rights as a citizen and your obligation to serve. It's the same in a Greek polis. So this is the other system. And note in this system, the state, the Roman Republic writ large, is actually shifting a lot of the costs of military activity onto the soldiers. And so it doesn't necessarily have to raise as much in taxes because the soldiers are going to sustain a lot of those costs. Roman soldiers buy their own equipment. Hilariously, they also have their food deducted from their pay. 
And their pay is really low and probably is mostly wiped out by their food bill. And so the cost to the Roman state of getting these guys in the field, it's not nothing, but it's much lower, almost a quarter of what it costs for, say, the Seleucid Empire to field a soldier. Despite the fact, and we'll get to this in a second, the Roman soldier is actually more heavily armed and armored, but much cheaper to the Roman state because he bears all of the costs. And in an entitlement system, you can do that. Entitlement system has very low overhead. You don't need a lot of administrators to run the system. The Romans basically expect their soldiers to recruit themselves. The Roman draft system happens entirely in the city of Rome. Rome does not have draft officers that come out to your local neighborhood or village. They expect you to show up to find out if you've been drafted, and then they send you home to go get your equipment and expect you to then show up again at the point of muster. No enforcement mechanisms here at all. But because your honor as a citizen, the honor of your family, your continued membership in the community is at stake, you do it. You show up. So the overhead's really low. That enormous cost that, say, the Seleucids were paying for administration, Rome doesn't need almost any of that. Resistance is also pretty low. You can get people to dig really deep in defense of a state that they see as theirs or a community that they feel they belong to, as opposed to a vast, impersonal, imperial state. And so you don't have as fierce, for instance, tax resistance as you might have in the sort of tax and spend model. The big problem with this kind of recruitment is that it doesn't scale very well. After all, only so many people are Athenians. They will fight for Athens because it belongs to them. And indeed, if you try to expand what it means to be Athenian, you may end up weakening the ties of the existing Athenaioi to the idea of Athens by overexpanding it. And so this system can't get very big. The bigger it gets, the less effective normally it gets. And so these sorts of entitlement systems, we tend to see them both in the ancient world and in the medieval world and even into the early modern world. These entitlement systems tend to be connected to very small polities, tribes, city-states, very small republics. What makes Rome unique and unusual is that they have managed to scale this system to cover the whole of peninsular Italy. And the way that they have done this is by functionally franchising it. You have Rome and the Roman citizen body. And the Roman citizen body makes up about a third-ish to a quarter-ish of the population of Italy. They're not even a majority. But the Roman citizen population, right, they serve out of dedication to Rome. Okay. But then Rome has all of these quote unquote alliances whereby all of these other communities in Italy that are not Roman nevertheless agree to send soldiers to fight in Rome's armies in exchange for some stuff from Rome. And so as a result, when Rome calls up troops, which again, they do every single year, when Rome calls up troops, the Romans serve out of patriotic love for Rome and out of a desire not to be ashamed in front of their fellow Romans and say, the Marci, that's one of Rome's subject, quote unquote, allied peoples in Italy, the Marci serve for patriotic love of Marsica and not to be ashamed in front of their fellow Marcians. And that process repeated to all of the communities across Italy. And so Rome has franchised out an entitlement based recruitment system across the whole of Italy. And so as a result, they not only get these really cheap, really dedicated Roman soldiers, they get really cheap really dedicated soldiers from all of these other communities. And that's what allows them to just comprehensively across the board, wildly outmobilize their opponents. I think one of the most fascinating aspects of the military capabilities of Rome was the degree of loyalty shown by their allies in Latium and Greater Italy, known generally as the Succii, who formed a very large part of the Roman army. Despite losing tens of thousands of troops in disasters at sea or the battles against Hannibal Barca, the majority of Succii remained steadfast alongside the Republic during the Punic Wars and beyond. Why do you think Rome was able to inspire such confidence in their allies, even during times of crisis or potential weakness? The first thing we need to say is that in this period, 
it certainly wasn't for patriotic love of Rome. I think Fronda's book Between Rome and Carthage makes this point really well. The Romans maybe are beginning in this period to think of Italy as a, a united thing that is connected to Rome, but the Italians do not yet seem to think that way. They are in many fractured little communities. They make the political moves that they think are in the interests of their community. The Capuans do what they think is best for Capua, not what is best for Rome. And indeed, in Capua's case, that means bailing on Rome in the Second Punic War. There are a few things, however, that makes Rome's system durable. Um, what Fronda points out, one thing is that all of these little communities hate each other. They all have small local rivalries that date from before Rome subdued the whole peninsula, which means that they all rely on Rome as a security guarantor against their neighbors who are also Roman allies. So when Capua, for instance, bails on the Romans, the result is that all of the other Campanian communities hew even closer to Rome because Capua is the local power center and Capua's rise would be at their expense. There's that irony that Rome is taking advantage of the fractured nature of internal politics. There is another element of the system which I think is, is really significant to note. As I said, the Sokii are assessing these deals based on what is good for them. As a result, the system only works if the deal is good for them, and it also only works if the deal isn't insulting to them, if it doesn't injure their honor. The way that the Romans, therefore, have to set up this arrangement, and it's not clear that they intended to, though they do seem to understand later what they have done. It's not clear that, that this was designed. It could have been happy accident, is that they end up structuring their alliance system much like the way patronage obligations work in Roman society. Now, in Roman society, this is a very, very, very common social institution that lower status Romans will attach themselves to higher status Romans. The higher status Roman is the patron. The lower status Roman is the client. And indeed, in Roman society, this could have multiple tiers. So you might be the client of a patron who is in turn the client of an even more influential Roman. This relationship created some reciprocal obligations. The patron was expected to protect his client legally and maybe economically, and the client is expected to support his patron politically. You vote for me, and then if you get into legal trouble, I represent you and use my influence for you in court. I protect you legally. You support me. You're the client in this arrangement. You support me politically. That's the sort of exchange going on. And so this is an unequal relationship. The patron is very clearly greater than, more important than the client, but it's a reciprocal relationship that both parties benefit from. And crucially, in Roman thought, this was a relationship that wasn't an insult to either party, at least so long as you were polite about it. The Romans, for instance, you never called your client, or your patron for that matter, a client in public. He was your friend. He was your amicus which is complete nonsense, right? He's your client. He's not your friend. When Cicero is talking about the amici that he defends at court that are very junior Roman politicians or just regular everyday Romans, these are not his friends. He does not go to dinner parties with these people. They're his clients. And likewise, as a side note, when Cicero talks of Pompey or Caesar as his amicus, he doesn't go to their dinner parties either. He is their client. But you need to obscure that to avoid injuring anybody's honor. You have to paper over it. But as long as you did paper over it this way, the nice thing about this in Roman society was that it wasn't considered shameful, which is actually a real contrast to the Greek world, where being a client in the Greek world was seen as demeaning, as being less than fully free. It's not seen that way in Roman Italy. And as the Romans recognize later, they structure their alliance system this way. Both Cicero and one of the early jurists, whose name I'm forgetting now, are actually explicit that the relationship of an unequal treaty, an unequal alliance, is like patronage relationships. They actually say this. They're, that's how they understand it. So Rome structures their relationship this way. These alliances, you know, I make air quotes. You can't see me, but I'm making air quotes around alliances. These alliances are really subject relations but they're reciprocal subject relations. So what's exchanged? Rome promises to protect the allies and give them a slice of the rewards of successful military activity. And in exchange, the allies promise to support Rome in its wars and to send troops to fill out its armies. 
That's the reciprocal exchange. You can see it is quite similar to the civilian patronage exchange. It's a good deal. Italy, especially in the 5th and 4th century and into the 3rd century, Italy is a tough neighborhood. Gauls regularly raid down into Italy. It's potentially exposed militarily to whoever is in positions of power influence in Greece and Macedonia. The internal conflict in Italy is pretty fierce. You have a lot of really tough people like the Samnites who live up in the central hills of Italy that raid down into the countryside. There are various expansionist powers. Italy is a tough neighborhood. And warfare in this period is pretty much winner takes all. So an ironclad guarantee of protection in this kind of environment is extremely valuable. And what's interesting to me is that the Romans don't appear to have been as cynical as you might think about this deal. They take the reciprocal exchange very seriously. So for instance, when I say the Romans were supposed to protect the allies, well, did they? And the answer is yes. The Romans are willing to fight aggressively to keep enemies away from allied territory. The Romans are not the kind of power that's going to, well, we're not really going to try it until they threaten our core territory. The Romans repeatedly engage Pyrrhus of Epirus outside of Roman territory. They throw away army after army against Hannibal, who as a point never attacks the Ager Romanus, that is Rome's actual territory. Hannibal's raiding is entirely confined to the allies. And nevertheless, the Romans are willing to throw away army after army after army to try and make him stop. And at the end of this period, the Romans will again throw away three consular armies trying to keep the Cimbri and the Teutones out of Etruria. So the Romans show again and again, when they say they're guaranteeing your security, they mean it. They will fight and bleed and if necessary, die to try and keep enemies away from the fields of the Etruscans. The security guarantee for them is extraordinarily real, right? And the Romans probably wouldn't have talked about it this way. They wouldn't have talked about it in terms of a security guarantee. The Romans talk about this in terms of Roman trust, what they call fides. And the Romans are very emphatic about fides to the point that it actually annoys some of the Greeks. Hiero II of Syracuse complains that Roman diplomats are always harping on and on about fides. Fides this and fides that. But you can see how fides was the currency that made this system work. The allies need to believe that the security guarantee is good because that's what makes the deal worth keeping. In a weird irony then, the Roman willingness to get so thoroughly drubbed by Hannibal may have actually made at least some of Rome's allies more confident in Rome rather than less. By 216, they could not doubt that if a Carthaginian army tried to raid their land, the Romans will fight them for it. They may not win, but they will at least try and protect you, which is more than you can say for a lot of imperial hegemons. At the same time, the Roman promise notionally that allies got a share of the loot of successful warfare, that wasn't empty either. Livy generally records as his narrative whenever a general celebrates a triumph, he tells us how much shares of the loot in cash each rank of the army gets. And it's a standard phrasing that he uses again and again that he ends this by noting, and the allies got the same. It was like the regular soldiers got this many denarii and the centurions this much and these guys this much, and the allies got the same over and over again because the allies got equal shares of the triumphal loot. This is broken only one time in the Livy we have. Of course, we don't have all of Livy, but in the Livy we have in 177, Gaius Claudius Polcare only gives the allies half a share, and they're so offended that when they march in the triumph, they refuse to sing the customary triumphal songs. They march behind in silent protest. So it clearly bothered them quite a lot that this standard relationship was kept. Likewise, we see significant evidence that at least some of the time when Rome would take land, the allies might be permitted to participate in the settlement of that land and the creation of new Roman colonies. And so this was a system, in Tim Cornell's words, Rome was running a criminal gang that compensated its victims by enrolling them in the gang and giving them a share of its future robberies. But that was part of the arrangement, right? That's part of the deal. But if you're the Sokii and you're in the gang, that makes it a pretty good deal because Rome wins a lot. Being part of Rome's gang is a cush gig. It's good. You like that. And so I think those factors, those sort of three factors, 
the fragmentation of the Italians, the importance and solidity of Rome's security guarantee, and the economic proposition that Rome will cut you in on the loot if you serve, I think these are the main factors that keep the allies on board through thick and through thin when Rome seems to be winning and when it seems to be in trouble. And it keeps them serving a tremendous amount. I do want to stress this. Rome raises an army every year. So when we say these sorts of things, when Rome raises an army, the allies are called up to serve. Yeah, Rome is calling for your community to send some guys to fight every year. I've done the math, and actually Nate Rosenstein has also done this math in his book, Rome at War. The average socius, the average adult allied male probably spends five to eight years serving in the Roman army. So when we say like the Romans call up the allies, they really do. They pull hard on these guys, but they do present them with a good deal. And so the allies stick with it. Quantity has a quality all its own. But the Hellenistic kings were able to maintain a standing professional army versus the Republic's levies. Debates about the tactics of legion versus phalanx aside, did the quality of the troops differ between a Roman soldier and a Seleucid one, whether in terms of their equipment or their experience on the battlefield? Yes, would be my argument here would be yes, though to some degree we're on more difficult ground because we're comparing intangibles to a degree. I don't think we should dismiss the fighting quality of the sort of core Hellenistic phalanx. It was clearly very effective in a variety of circumstances. On the other hand, their win rate against Roman armies after 275 is terrible. They basically always lose. So there's clearly something going wrong here for these Hellenistic armies. It is a little tricky to discuss why they lose because every battle is weird. Kynocephali is weird. Pydna is weird. Magnesia is weird. Thermopylae is weird. They're all weird. Every battle is weird. But I think there are some things we can point to. We can talk about equipment. The Romans were, on balance, more expensively and more heavily equipped. They had somewhere between a quarter and a third more metal in their equipment, metal being the sort of most expensive kind of material that you can make equipment out of. And so if you're contrasting a Roman heavy infantryman who is increasingly wearing male armor in this period with his Seleucid counterpart whose armor is something like a linothorax, the Romans' armor is just way more expensive. That is a much more expensive way to armor your soldier. And mail is very effective. To give a sense of how expensive mail could be, a mail set of armor of the kind the Romans wear, which it's, right, this is, I keep calling it mail. This is chain mail. You'll sometimes hear it described, right? Interlinking metal rings, alternating solid and riveted rings. What the Romans wear is they wear a garment of this kind of mail that reaches about down to their knees, and then it has reinforcement on the shoulders, usually. That kind of armor might require something like 40,000 small iron rings to be made and joined, which might take you something like 20,000 hours to do. So it's extraordinarily expensive. Oh, and it might take something like 7 to 9 kilograms of iron to produce it. And this cuts across a lot of Roman equipment. Another good example is the pilum, the Roman infantry javelin. Roman heavy infantry carried two of these. The light Roman javelin guys, the Willites, carried a different kind of javelin. But the main Roman heavy infantry carried two pila. And the pilum is remarkable because it is a single-use expendable heavy metal weapon, which you think back to earlier in the podcast, we talked about how expensive metal could be, how much work it took to produce this stuff. Each pilum's got a heavy wooden core and then a long metal tip. That's about 300 grams of iron per javelin. You carry two of them. And when you throw it at the enemy because of the way it's made, it bends on impact. It's a one-use weapon system. If you recover a pilum at the end of the battle, at the very least, you need a blacksmith to hammer it straight again. So it's an expendable weapon. They're really effective javelins. They're very lethal. Some modern experimentation with these suggests that they can punch through quite a few different kinds of armor and shields. That very long, thin shank behind the tip, that's where all the iron is, it will punch through a shield. And then because the shank is so thin and the heavy wooden weight on the back is so heavy, it will keep going to hit the man carrying the shield, which should be properly terrifying for your fellow in the, the Hellenistic phalanx, right? It's going to punch through my aspis and then still stab me or render my aspis useless or both. So it's a very effective weapon, but it's an expensive weapon that you throw once. It's clear that the Romans are investing more in equipment on a man-for-man -man basis than their rivals are. 
I think they're able to do this in part, again, because of the efficiency of their mobilization system and because soldiers are buying their own equipment. And when you think about it, right, if Antiochus III is buying my equipment for me, he may place one value on my survival in battle. If I'm buying my equipment for myself, I probably place a higher value on my life than Antiochus does. And so the Romans seem to have splurged on their equipment, which I think did give them real advantages in battle. Mail in particular, I think, is impactful here. It's a new technology in this period. The Romans are early adopters. It's invented by the Gauls. The Romans are the first major state on the Mediterranean to pick this stuff up. They really like it. One of the advantages of mail is that it renders you functionally immune to cutting blows. No amount of strength will allow a sword to cut through the metal links of mail armor. You can stab through it, but you can't slice through it, which may have been a real disadvantage for your Hellenistic infantrymen. Obviously, you've got the sarissa, that's a stabbing weapon, but once the Roman is inside the tip of your pike, your recourse is to your swords, and your options here are either the xiphos or the coppice, both of which are really cutting swords. The xiphos is a multi-purpose sword that's better at cutting, and the coppice is just a dedicated chopper that can't stab at all. These would not be effective weapons against an enemy in mail. So I think the Romans are on the balance. They are better equipped. I think the other thing you can say, does the average Roman have more combat experience? Certainly in the first half of the second century, I would say the answer is probably yes. The Roman military demands, they're recruiting so many soldiers, and it's a rolling recruitment process that they do every year, that it means that any Roman army is going to have some proportion, a relatively small, of troops that are basically green and have no experience, but then a lot of troops where this is their second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth campaign. And I think that that, to a degree, explains why Roman armies tend to be effective when battles get weird and why they tend to hold out when things maybe are looking a little pear-shaped is because they are a little bit more experienced and a little more battle-hardened because Rome goes to war every year, almost without exception. And so I do think that that probably also provides a qualitative advantage, although, again, I don't want to overstate that. You know, your average Antigonid phalangite probably also has a decent amount of combat experience in the end. Though, I feel the need to note, uh, Polybius flags the Antigonids. He says the Antigonids have the best soldiers man for man. Men and equipment are what most think of in terms of determining an army's strength, but there are dozens of factors that play a role in how a state conducts war. Are there perhaps any other notable features of the Roman system that provides them an advantage that people may not immediately consider? So I think there, there is one that folks don't think about, but is in fact really important, and this is what we might call distributed command. So Rome has potentially the ability to raise more soldiers from a smaller population through this mobilization system. That doesn't actually help you field larger armies. And the reason is that because of the limitations of transport in the ancient world, and indeed all the way through until the invention of the railroad, armies were basically limited in size to how large they could be while still sustaining themselves on the food that they could gather locally. They're moving across the countryside, buying, borrowing, or usually stealing the local food. And if the army is too big, there won't be enough. And so that puts a cap on the size that you can get your armies, depending on the region you're in. And so having the ability to raise huge armies doesn't necessarily mean that you can have all these guys in one place. So Rome's massive resources don't allow it to field bigger armies necessarily outside of Roman territory. And indeed, the, the armies that Rome sends to the Hellenistic East are chunky, but they're not enormous. The Romans are often outnumbered, particularly, right? The Romans are dramatically outnumbered by the Seleucids at Magnesia, if you believe our sources. Instead of making individual Roman armies huge, Rome's resources allowed them to have many armies. Now, on the one hand, this let them replace armies after defeats, that if a Roman army is defeated in the field, the Romans just raise and send another one um, because they have that deep well of resources. But it also allows the Romans to fight in multiple places at the same time. At points, for instance, in the Second Punic War, Rome simultaneously 
is undergoing military operations in Spain, northern Italy, central Italy, southern Italy, Sicily, and Illyria, all with separate armies and maintaining a fleet. So instead of having all those guys in one place, you've got one army bottling up Hannibal, one army beating up the Gauls in northern Italy, one army reducing Capua because they bailed, another army on Sicily messing with Syracuse, and then another army in Spain chewing up the Carthaginian Empire there, and then a fleet, and then another army and another small fleet that's dealing with Philip V and the Antigonids in the First Macedonian War, which is happening at the same time. They can do this all at once. Those huge resources get you the troops. The issue then is distributed command. Can your political system tolerate having many armies? If you look at the Hellenistic political system, the answer is no. The main field army of the Seleucid or Ptolemaic state is almost always organized around the person of the king. You can't really trust anybody else with the army, because if you give one of your courtiers the whole army, he might decide that he should be king. There's also a cultural expectation going back through Alexander and Philip and then before them that Macedonian kings lead their armies in person. And so as a result, it's much harder. It's not impossible, but it's much harder for distributed command to work in the Hellenistic system. But Rome is a republic, and as a republic, it can engage in distributed command. Any senator can be handed an army and told to go do something. And there are 300 of those guys. You're never going to run out of generals. Moreover, the Roman political career path means that every single one of those senators has served in the army and then been a queester. And queesters were often logistics officers. Every senator from the most junior to the most senior is notionally capable, has the skills and training necessary to lead an army. And so if Rome needs two, three, four, five active field armies, they're not going to run out of commanders to do that job. And so they can distribute command. They can operate in a wide range of places at once. This is a strength that's going to continue to help the Romans. Obviously, it's going to bite them a bit in the civil wars of the first century, but then it doesn't go away. Augustus is able to reinstitute a system of distributed command with his legates, and so this is a strength that's going to continue really until the end of the crisis of the third century, when it finally becomes clear that the threat of repeated civil war compels that the field armies have to be concentrated around the person of the emperor, that Roman distributed command will finally break down then. But in the meantime, it's an enormous advantage for the Romans to be able to fight multiple wars at the same time or fight a given war on multiple fronts at the same time. Essentially, the Roman Republic and later the Roman Empire can walk and chew bubblegum at the same time. Indeed, it can walk, chew bubblegum, and play ping pong and dance a jig all at the same time. And that's a product of massive Roman resources, yes, but also the Roman political system creating a class of leader that allows for this distributed command. The rapid expansion of the Roman Republic during this period was a dramatic demonstration of the strength of their system. Ironically, the more wars Rome won, the further they would have to campaign against new rivals or to maintain their control over acquired territories. How well did the Republic's armies adapt to the increasing demands of going from the dominant power of central Italy to overseeing an empire that now stretched over three continents? So from a purely military perspective, I think we'd say the Romans adapted quite well. They adapt materially, they adopt new equipment, new armor like mail, new weapons, they pick up Greek catapults, for instance, new types of ships. They even toy with more exotic styles of fighting like elephant troops before the Romans seemed to decide that elephants weren't worth the hassle. They shift their tactical system from one based on maniples to one based on cohorts to cope with the demands of fighting in Spain. And so on the battlefield, the Roman army is very adaptive. What does not adapt is that all important link between the army and the civil and political structure of Roman society, what in military studies we call the civil-military relationship, or the civ-mil, as it's sometimes spelled out. That becomes frozen and then breaks under the strain of Roman expansion. Roman conscription becomes increasingly onerous in the second century, particularly fighting in Spain which is very hard, and it's very long, and it doesn't pay very well. And this seems to result in draft evasion, which is not a problem the Romans had had earlier. 
Roman conquest also clearly reshapes Rome's political class. It creates really, really big winners among Rome's political elite, men that become so big in a system that is supposed to be about a lot of relatively equal Roman senatorial aristocrats competing with each other that you start to see men that are so big they break the system. Scipio Aemilianus is a sort of the precursor of this kind of thing. He runs for consul twice and illegally both times, but he's so popular that he wins anyway. And of course, that is, we can see in a way that the Romans at the time couldn't, we can see that the road from Scipio Aemilianus leads to Marius and Sulla and Pompey and Caesar. We can see that the system is going to continue breaking down. And so on the one hand, the military on the battlefield is very adaptive. On the other hand, the Roman political order fails to change in ways that it needs to in order to assimilate to this new reality. What also, of course, doesn't adapt is the Roman alliance system. The product of Roman victories, as they're pushing that frontier out, outside of Italy, Rome does not create new allies. Outside of Italy, they create provinces, and in the provinces, you collect taxes. That tax revenue flows to Rome, and unlike loot from victory or seized land made into settlements, new colonies, taxes are not shared with the allies. And so that means over the course of the second century, as Rome begins building an overseas empire, right, that balance of gain in Rome's victories begins tilting more and more in favor of Roman citizens. I don't think it's an accident that we start to see this most fiercely in the 130s and 120s because you have the Gracchi out there proposing and in some cases creating all of these wonderful social programs the distribution of land by Tiberius Gracchus, the distribution of grain by Gaius Gracchus, paid for with tax revenues from overseas, particularly the province of Asia, newly incorporated out of the Adelid Kingdom, which the allies are not eligible for. And so that balance of gain shifts. The allies used to get half the loot, but now that the loot is a continuous tax stream, they don't get any of that. And I think that we can see this being one of the elements that is destabilizing the Roman alliance system, leading to its catastrophic breakdown in the late 90s with the social wars, right? The whole thing implodes. So again, I would say on the battlefield, Rome adapts well. At home, in the political arena, and in the important link civil military linkages between the army and the civilian society that it is supposed to defend, that is where Rome fails to adapt. And that is how the Republic dies. It has been argued by both moralists and historians alike that the expansion into the East and the plunder taken from Greece, Asia, and North Africa caused great changes in the political and socio-economic environment of Rome. In your opinion, did the influx of this massive amount of wealth affect the conduct of the Republic's foreign policy? Was there any measurable impact on the men of the lower class who served as soldiers? So in terms of Rome's foreign policy, it has is, it is long been noted that monetary considerations, the, the gaining of loot and spoils and potentially vast tax revenue was a consideration that begins driving Roman politics in, in this period, if not honestly earlier, it's, it had always been. And of course, Rome's broader imperial frontiers draw them in to more conflicts, though I feel the need to note, I use the phrase draw them in. The Romans leap enthusiastically into most conflicts with both feet. The Romans of this period think war is swell. I think as I've already hinted at, it's also clear in terms of the flow of wealth that the Roman political structure was not prepared for the kinds of flows of wealth that this warfare would produce, which produced the kind of men like Marcus Licinius Crassus in the first century who could buy his own army and as a result breaks the power of the Senate, breaking up the power of the Republic. And so I think that that's certainly a pattern as well. On the ground, in terms of the lives of regular people, it's much harder to say. They're a lot less visible to us. Our literary sources give us a narrative, and the narrative is that the great wealth of conquest and the supply of massive amounts of enslaved labor that is definitely happening, huge numbers of people taken from Rome's conquests, enslaved and forced to work on estates in Italy and Sicily, that's definitely happening. The narrative is that this leads to the impoverishment of the old Roman freeholding farmer class, and that that leads to some of the political instability of the late second and early first century. Archaeologists have begun to push back on this notion. We do not see the vast expansion of the villa estates that our sources seem to think is happening. 
while demographic modeling seems to suggest that, and this is Nate Rosenstein's argument in, in Rome at War, um, what's happening is not that the Roman peasants are being immiserated, but in fact that Roman family patterns were keyed on an assumption of extremely high military mortality. And so Roman military success in the second century means that a lot of men that normally would have died in battle don't. They survive, and there's no land available for them. And so they're flooding into Rome, not because they've been kicked off their estates, but because their like, older brother has the farm, and they've survived, whereas they would have perhaps died earlier. And so the narrative here is complicated. There is certainly this narrative in our sources about wealth and, you know, Sallust waxes eloquent about the degrading impact of luxuria on Roman morals. And there is certainly in the narrative around the Gracchi, the idea that the poor are being crushed underneath this changing system. And you have older scholars, Keith Hopkins, perhaps most notably, who advanced this as a position but the archaeological evidence doesn't necessarily seem to conform. In fact, what we see in the first century is that it's a period of apparently rising living standards. The diet seems to get more varied. Trade is picking up pretty massively. We see a lot of new minting and new coinage, which suggests more economic activity. A lot of this new wealth is, of course, we know captured by the elites. We can definitely see in our sources that the difference between what a rich Roman looked like in 300 BC and what a rich Roman looked like in 100 BC, it is night and day. The Romans are building domi for themselves in Rome by the first century that resemble royal palaces. So the upper class of Rome's elite has clearly just skyrocketed into wealth. So they're clearly capturing a lot of the wealth that Roman conquest is producing. But I think there is a fair bit of evidence that suggests that they're not capturing all of it. And there's also, I think, a fair bit of evidence to suggest that the incorporation of these territories is having broader economic impacts on trade and production that do benefit the people of the commons. Now, on the flip side, we also have to note, because we're talking about the first century by this point, that the first century is also a period of deep violence and instability. And so, you know, notionally rising living standards may be little comfort if they come in a period where men like Sulla and Caesar are rampaging across the countryside, killing everyone. It is a complex picture, and I think we should acknowledge that the influx of wealth is reshaping Roman society in so many ways. And it's often hard to say if that reshaping was positive or negative. Obviously, it kills the Republic. Having answered my last question, I think this is a great place to end our discussion. And I thank you once again for opting to come onto the podcast. There could be an endless discussion on the factors explaining the success of Roman military conquests, but I think that you have done a fine job neatly summarizing the most important elements. If my listeners would perhaps like to learn more about the topic or read some of your other works, do you have any current or upcoming projects that they can check out? Yeah, so I have a weekly history weblog at a collection of unmitigated pedantry, acoup.blog, where I put some of my thoughts. I am working on a, a book project tentatively entitled Why the Romans Always Won. We're still a few years, I think, out from that uh, appearing, so it's still in an initial stage. But one of these days it will show up. And I can also be found on Twitter at, at Brett Devereaux, where I mostly tweet about ancient history and security policy. Um, the sort of the other angle that a military historian must take. So I am not hard to find. As per protocol, I will make sure to include links to Dr. Devereaux's website and his social media in the podcast description and episode notes on my website. In the meanwhile, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>